stem cells and Parkinson's disease. Some of you may have seen an article by uh, Kikuchi et al. that just was uh, produced this year. And uh, uh, the uh, article in question is actually available on the internet. Uh, those of you who get the email have already got that. And uh, uh, before I launch into the article and other articles surrounding it, I think it would be worthwhile to review the subject because most of you, myself included to a certain extent, are uh, not experts in Parkinson's disease. Galen, physician in 175 AD, described something called the shaking palsy. That's a translation for paralysis agitans. And that's the classical name for Parkinson's disease. James Parkinson wrote an essay uh, on the shaking palsy in 1817, and because of that, the name got, or the disease got his name. And there's actually Parkinson's syndrome and Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is the most common cause of the syndrome. Uh, Parkinson's disease has three major components. One, tremor. Two, paucity of movement. By that I mean uh, the face is kind of mask-like. The patient does not have spontaneous movements when they walk. Their arms don't swing as normal people's arms do. Um, uh, everything is done much more slowly. The tremor is an interesting problem because you'll have somebody with a tremor. Um, one of my uh, colleagues described a watchmaker who had Parkinson's disease and then he goes down to work on his uh, watches and all of a sudden the movements just smooth right out. It was incredible to see. Uh, and then as soon as he finished working on the watch, his hand would start shaking again. Uh, tends to be unilateral, but it, as time goes on, it becomes bilateral. Um, and there is some increased tone, something called lead piping. That, that is to say, you move the arm and it's rigid. You're going to move it and it hard to move, but once you get it to the new place, it stays there. Yeah. Sort of like lead pipes that can be bent, and once they're bent, they stay there, and then you bend them again, and they stay there, and then you go back to the first place, and then it's hard to get it back there. It isn't a preferred position. It's just wherever they are, they don't move. So those are the three major components. Now, there are a lot of other symptoms that come. Uh, one of the interesting ones is lack of atonia during REM sleep. That is to say, people like this will sometimes act out their dreams. Normally when you're dreaming, you're paralyzed. And so you can be dreaming and wild things are going on inside of your head and you're trying to run away from whatever it is or run towards whatever it is, and you're not moving. Sometimes you can sense that, sometimes you can't. But for these people, they actually move when that happens, and they'll cry out. Um, they will develop a soft voice. This is part of the paralysis. Uh, they develop decreased facial expression. Um, they look like they're not experiencing emotions. I guess this is a great thing to have if you're playing poker. Um, uh, depression or anhedonia, just don't feel anything inside. Um, slow thinking, and there are many other ones, autonomic disturbances. It uh, turns out the disease affects far more than just the traditional substantia nigra, uh, nigra, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and it is associated with dementia. At first, they thought people had both this, uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's type dementia. Turns out that Parkinson's all by itself with no evidence of Alzheimer's can also give you dementia although it doesn't always. It tends to preserve the uh, mind through all this uh, more than you might expect. Uh, obviously, this is not a disease anybody wants to have. Uh, the disease is progressive with time and oftentimes kills its victim. I, uh, 
one of my father's classmates, who was the father of one of my classmates in medical school, died of this disease. Um, there's deteriorations of the neurons when, you know, if people like this die, either from Parkinson's disease itself or perhaps from an auto accident or a heart attack or something, and they examine the brain. The neurons in the substantia nigra are decreased. The substantia nigra is a kind of an interesting part of the brain. It's discolored black. That's why it's called the substantia nigra. It's the black substance. And the reason it's there is because of melanin, which turns out to be um, a polymer of dopamine, which is the, the, the nerves in the substantia nigra actually release dopamine as their way of communicating with other nerves. Um, and uh, the putamen, well, there's actually a couple of other areas, the substantia nigra, which includes the butamen and uh, I think the caudate nucleus. And both of those get neurons from the substantia nigra. And because they're not stimulated as much, they tend to atrophy as well. Um, that becomes important because when they're trying to fix this, they oftentimes, instead of fixing the substantia nigra, they fix the putamen, which is kind of interesting. There are Lewy bodies, which uh, have now been shown to be made of something called synuclein, which is a protein. And interestingly, the most uh, common hereditary form of Parkinson's disease has a mutation in uh, the gene that codes for synuclein. Uh, dopamine helps the symptoms, but it does not arrest the course of the disease. The, uh, the, uh, you're treating the symptom and the neurons continue to degenerate. Uh, electrical stimulation helps, but again, is not a treatment, it is simply a cover-up for uh, what's going on. Uh, I, I mean, it's a, you're treating the symptoms again, okay? Um, now, one of the interesting things is that um, animals can be given something called 1-methyl-1,4-phenyl-1,2,3,6-tetrahydropyridine. Before you panic, you don't have to reproduce that at the end of this talk. Um, but, um, it, it, it was a contamination, uh, a contaminant of heroin at one point, and some heroin addict injected himself with heroin with this stuff and wound up destroying his substantia nigra and wound up giving himself Parkinson's disease. Um, and because of that, if they want to study Parkinson's disease in animals, what they'll do is they'll give them uh, M. PTP, you can see why they would call it that instead of that long name. And uh, the nerve cells in the substantia nigra are destroyed, and they can use this to make animal models. Um, there's another amino acid that, uh, or this is amino acid, that can give you the same problem, although it tends to also give you an Alzheimer's like syndrome. It's called beta methyl amino alanine. And uh, it's basically an alanine that has a uh, NHCH3 attached to the uh, methyl group on the uh, amino acid. And it can cause Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease uh, uh, type dementia. Um, this was discovered uh, when uh, they noticed that a syndrome uh, like this happened in Guam quite frequently, usually with the natives. And at first they thought it was genetic. Uh, but the interesting thing of it was that it happened primarily during and shortly after World War II. And after the, uh, that happened, it stopped occurring. And they managed to find out that it was caused primarily by eating too much of cycads. Uh, and uh, I think the cycad seeds had this beta methyl amino alanine in it. Uh, cycad. They're, they're a plant that's sort of a palm like or palmetto. And, uh, and so there are obviously chemicals that can cause a Parkinson like syndrome. 
although obviously most people who get it aren't eating those chemicals. Um, uh, some of you may remember that Michael J. Fox, a uh, famous actor who got this er, in his, I think, 20s or uh, early 30s at least. It was very, very young. Um, and of course, didn't want to die. And so has been very uh, strongly supportive of uh, Parkinson's disease research. And uh, Muhammad Ali had Parkinson's-like syndrome. So in Muhammad Ali, it's not clear whether that was um, just getting hit too many times or whether it was a genetic predisposition or perhaps a combination of both. Uh, that I know of, nobody sectioned his brain to find out whether he actually had Parkinson's disease or simply a Parkinson's syndrome. Uh, but it got into the press. So I'm going to come to the press release because sometimes that's easier to understand. Um, and we're not going to read the whole thing because we don't have time to do that and get through all of the stuff we want to look at but we're going to look at the, what I consider the pertinent parts of it. Um, this is the scientist which does a lot of these summaries. Uh, Parkinson's disease cell therapy relieves symptoms in monkeys was the title. Neurons derived from human induced pluripotent cell stem cells fill in for lost dopamine neurons in a primate model of the disease. The, dop the lost dopamine uh, neurons of course are those from the substantia nigra that are destroyed. And as we'll find out, um, uh, these were monkeys that were given uh, MTPT, or MPTP, whatever it is. Um, it's, I guess it's with a P at the end. Uh, cell therapy for Parkinson's disease is closer than ever. In a study published today, August 30, in Nature, an international team of researchers improving symptom, improved symptoms in a monkey model of Parkinson's disease by grafting dopamine-producing neurons from human-induced pluripotent cells, that's IPSCs, into the monkey's brains. We're going to see that thing come back on us later on. Skipping over a paragraph, Kyoto University neurosurgeon Jun Takahashi and colleagues generated eight IPSC lines from skin or blood cells collected from seven human subjects. Interestingly, three with Parkinson's disease and four without, and derived dopaminergic progenitors from these cell lines. Then the researchers grafted the reprogrammed cells into the brains of two to three-year-old male Sinomogus monkeys. These are shellfish-eating monkeys. Um, genus Macaca, if you ever wondered about Macaca and, uh, and uh, George Allen, that's where that came from, that had been treated with a neurotoxin MPTP, which kills dopamine-releasing neurons and results in Parkinson disease-like movement defects. The seven monkeys that received either cells derived from the individuals with PD or healthy individuals showed a 40 to 50 percent improvement in symptoms such as increases in spontaneous movement and decreases in tremors for at least a year compared to vehicle injected controls. The authors confirmed that cells derived from both PD patients and healthy donors made dopamine in vivo um, at levels about half that of cells in normal monkeys. Uh, they're not perfect, but they're better. The grafted cells also sent out fibers, survived for 24, the 24 month duration of the experiment and it did not form teratomas. Now, if you've been following this, you go, what, what, what's this bit about teratomas? Well, as we will see, um, uh, if you inject embryonic cells into a patient, a monkey, whatever, one of the risks you have is developing a tumor from those cells. And it's a tumor that since the, it's made from embryonic tissue, it can produce any kind of tissue you want. That's a, what a teratoma is. 
Brundon says it's not surprising that cells derived from people with Parkinson's disease were about as effective as those from healthy people. Even if the cells carry genetic risk factors for the disease, environmental insults are likely also required to make the cells show signs of pathology, he says. What are those environmental insults? We don't know. And in many people, we don't know what the original defect was either. But whatever. Skipping down a few paragraphs, in the planned clinical trial, the research will use IPSC derived from healthy donors, not from the subject's own cells, which could raise issues with graft re rejection. That is to say, it would be nicer if you got it from your own cells, wouldn't it? Then there's no issue of graft, graft versus host or host versus graft, whichever. But Takahashi's group also published an accompanying paper today in Nature Communications that offers a partial solution. So they made this research into two papers. Yes, that pads your resume. Oh, never mind. Um, in the study, the researchers showed that matching donors and recipients for the major histocompatibility complex, which is involved in self versus non-self re recognition, lowers the risk of graft rejection in monkeys. What they're saying is it's just like renal transplants. If you get a matched donor, it works better. Based on these results, the researchers will attempt to match donor and recipient types of the human version of major histocompatibility complex, hist uh, human leukocyte antigen, and use immunosuppressant drugs in the upcoming clinical trial. Skipping on, induced pluripotent stem cells, iPS cells, are a promising source for a cell-based therapy to treat Parkinson's disease in which midbrain dopaminergic neurons progressively degenerate. However, long-term analysis of human iPS cells derive, uh, cell derived dopaminergic neurons in primate Parkinson's disease models has never been performed to our knowledge. Here we show that human iPS cell derived dopaminergic pro progenitor cells survived and functioned as midbrain dopaminergic neurons in a primate model of Parkinson's disease treated with the neurotoxin MPTP. Score-based and video recording analyses revealed an increase in spontaneous movement of the monkeys after transplantation. Histological studies showed that the mature dopaminergic neurons extended dense neurites into the host striatum. This effect was consistent regardless of whether the cells were derived from patients with Parkinson's disease or from healthy individuals. Um, so that works. Uh, continuing the abstract, so cells sorted by the floor plate model Corin did not form any tumors in the brain for at least two years. Finally, magnetic resonance imaging and positron emission tomography were used to monitor the survival, expansion, and function of the grafted cells as well as the immune response in the host brain. Thus, this preclinical study using a primate model indicates that human IPS cell derived dopaminergic progenitors are clinically applicable for the treatment of patients with Parkinson's disease. Now they may be a little more enthusiastic. They have um, uh, incentive to be overly enthusiastic because their next grant will depend on how well their research here went and they are planning to do more research. Uh, to get into the body of the, uh, of the uh, uh, paper itself, most of, uh, most of what's uh, there has actually been included in the uh, um, uh, abstract, but there are a few interesting things that, w that I'm gonna show you. Midbrain dopaminergic neurons can be efficiently induced from human embryonic stem cells and iPS cells. Embryonic stem cells are not derived from people. Um, well, depends on how you define person, I guess. Um, they're derived from embryos. If you're curious, yes, they are aborted embryos. Uh, and when grafted into the striatum, can improve the impaired behavior of rat and non-human primate models of Parkinson's disease. Uh, notice in passing that 
they didn't improve uh, people when injected. At least it's not being reported and accepted. Um, cell differentiation protocols that generate clinically applicable dopaminergic, dopaminergic neurons from human um, embryonic stem cells or induced um, uh, pluripotent cells have been proposed recently. To address the efficacy and safety of the generated dopaminergic neurons, is this going to work? Is it safe? We introduced the dopaminergic progenitor cells and grafted them into the putamen of MT MPTP treated synomogous monkeys. Um, in other words, we're going to try it on animals first. Uh, another concern is whether dopaminergic neurons derived from patients with Parkinson's disease could survive and function after transplantation. Think of it, if, if normal cells work but Parkinson's cells don't, then you can't use your own cells if you've got Parkinson's disease, right? So finding that Parkinson's has worked means that you could do auto-transplantation. Um, the cell, uh, d neurons derived from patients with Parkinson's disease could survive and function after transplantation as well as those derived from healthy individuals. Therefore, we investigated the function of dopaminergic neurons derived from both patients with sporadic PD and healthy individuals. They didn't go after the familiar DP PD at this point, although, to be fair, that's a minority of Parkinson's disease patients anyway. Skipping on down. Um, uh, of interest, one monkey, number 10, unexpectedly weakened at eight months owing to acute gas accumulation in the intestines and was euthanized. We omitted this monkey from the behavioral analyses. Is that a treated monkey? I think so. Um, that raises an interesting question. If we do this, are we going to find that one out of every 20 people who get this suddenly have their guts no longer work? I don't know. The that may be a freak accident. It may be something that we have to pay attention to. The recovery rates were significantly higher in the transplanted monkeys. 53.6 plus or minus 8.5, that's the movement score. 41.7 plus or minus 14.4 and 10.4 plus or minus 10% uh, at 12 months from the cells for healthy individuals, cells from patients with Parkinson's disease, and control in injections respectively. So basically 53 and 41 are not statistically different from each other, although 53 is better than 41. Um, is that a trend? Is that important? I don't know. And they don't know. Nobody knows. But it is better than 10.4 plus or minus 10 for the controls. There was no difference in recovery whether the donor cells were derived from healthy individuals or patients with Parkinson's disease. Well, no significant difference anyway. Skipping on down, the impaired behavior of MPTP treated monkeys can be restored by the transplantation of dopaminergic neurons derived from monkey ES cells. That's not reported in this paper. That's obviously coming from somewhere else monkey IPS cells and human ES cells in which 4,300 to 13,000 uh, TH cells survived per animal. In other words, there's actually a dose dependence on how much you get. You have to give so many cells in order to make it work. And interestingly, you'll notice that it's been given in the putamen, not in the substantia nigra. That's because in the substantia nigra, in order to work, it would have to grow Neuro, uh, axons up into the putamen. Maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. And so they're putting them straight into the putamen. So it's not, r we're not really going back to zero. We're going back to something that might work. Skipping on down, I'm going to just uh, leave the rest of the methods and all that <laughs> stuff. Fascinating reading, but um, not relevant for what we're going to be talking about today. So what kind of options do we have for Parkinson's disease so far? Well, there was a green gland cells, which were being used in Mexico. And some of you may remember that Muhammad Ali went down to Mexico and visited the doctor who was trying this stuff. Uh, it seems to have petered out. Nobody else is doing it. 
um uh, Muhammad Ali um, it wasn't clear whether he actually considered it or not. He said he didn't. I have a feeling that that's probably uh, um, uh, justification after the fact. Um, uh, reading the, the news accounts at the time, it looks like probably the doctor said, no, I don't think it would help you personally. Don't try. But in any case, it looks like he didn't take it. That was adrenal gland. That was from his own adrenal glands who had been, hey, they produced dopamine, why not, right? Fetal stem cells, they're gotten from aborted fetuses. Embryonic stem cells, they're gotten from previous embryos where they keep the embryonic stem cell line going for years and years and years. Some of you may remember back uh, uh, in the day when uh, George Bush was being hounded to, uh, uh, to f fully fund all stem cell research, which meant we could get uh, embryonic stem cells from whatever. And he said, no, you can have the lines you have now, but no further ones. Uh, at least the government wouldn't fund it. Um, and uh, uh, there were people howling with rage at that. Uh, because we were uh, uh, not allowing cures to develop that were just out there if we could just get our hands on this stuff. And then, of course, there's induced adult stem cells, which is the present paper and which is what is being used more commonly now. And those are derived from adults. You don't have to kill them in order to make it work. And of course, the advocacy groups are commonly arguing for the use of embryonic stem cells, but perhaps the best example being the Michael J. Fox uh, organization. And uh, they have a website and they have a thing called Stem Cells and Parkinson's Disease, which we'll read some relevant portions. First, I'm gonna skip over what are stem cells. And then adult versus embryonic stem cells because adult stem cells become more committed to a particular tissue type during development, Unlike embryonic stem cells, they appear to only develop into a limited number of cell types. They are multipotent instead of pluripotent. Um, so embryonic are better. Um, what are induced pluripotent stem cells? And in addition to embryonic um, stem cells, induced pluripotent st uh, stem cells discovered in 2007 represent an important development in stem cell research to treat diseases like Parkinson's disease. Essentially, IPS cells are man-made cells that share um, embryonic stem cells' ability to become other cell types. Um, IPS cells, I think it's capitalized because it starts at the beginning of the word, um, are created when scientists convert it or reprogram a mature cell, such as a skin cell, into an embryonic-like state. Uh, continuing on. Uh, what is the Michael J. Fox Foundation's view on stem cells to treat Parkinson's disease? They're very clear about it. Skipping on to the one that's the important part. Although embryonic uh, stem cells, and now IPS, um, little i, cells hold great potential, we do not yet know which stem cell type ultimately holds the greatest promise. Maybe it'll be embryonic, maybe it will be um, IPS. Uh, thus researchers require scientific freedom to pursue research on all types. They need that freedom. Who's taking it away from them? Well, federal government, I think. Um, including EES, adult and IPS cells in order to yield results for patients. Think about that. Um, what's happening is that they are quite sure there is a cure out there and they're quite sure that um, uh, there's no reason not to use almost too vigorous there um, and uh, then uh, they have one more paragraph at the bottom uh, which we'll skip 
this is interesting. Somebody looks like uh, they didn't uh, get their capitalization right. I can't blame that one on being at the beginning of a sentence. Whatever. Okay, well, is that the isolated incident? Uh, there's a Eurostem cell, and I'm going to quote one of the things that they have, uh, that they have on that website it's very shortly. Transplantation of young brain cells from human fetuses into Parkinson's disease patients has shown promising results. Uh, there's no date on this thing, by the way, so I don't know when this was written, or whether it was revised or whether it will be revised. The current TransEuro study is re-examining this treatment method with the aim of minimizing side effects and measuring efficacy. So we're going to do fetuses. This is not just embryonic stem cells. This is actual take fetuses, and we're going to get into that in a little bit, um, and use them. Um, and um, then there's the cureparkinsons.org uh, which uh, this one is dated, so I know when it was written. Um, breakthrough in stem, stem cell research for Parkinson's. Um, in a major breakthrough for the treatment of Parkinson's disease, researchers working with laboratory rats shows it is possible to make dopamine cells from embryonic stem cells and transplant them into the brain, replacing the cells lost to the disease. Um, human embryonic stem cells precursor cells that have the potential to become any part, any cell of the body, are a promising source of new dopamine cells, but they have proved difficult to harness for this purpose. Ooh. Difficult to harness. Why? Doesn't actually say. Now, a breakthrough study from Lund University in Sweden shows it is possible to get human embryonic stem cells to produce a new generation of dopamine cells that behave like native dopamine cells when transplanted into the brains of rats. Sounds promising. The authors note that their study shows strong preclinical support for using dopamine cells made from human embryonic stem cells using approaches similar to those established with fetal cells for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. There has been some success with using fetal cells. So there's the fetal cell cells, there's the embryonic stem cell lineage cells. This is what they're using in, in this particular instance, but these are harder to source and there are ethical concerns about taking tissue from aborted fetuses. Ethical concerns? I thought scientists needed to be free to do anything, apparently regardless of ethical concerns. Uh, and then another site, <coughs> Are Parkinson's disease stem cells therapies ready for clinical trials? It depends, some say. This is Parkinson's news today. Uh, and this one is March uh, 31, 2016. Stem cell therapy, which many people living with Parkinson's disease have long pinned hope on as potential cure or treatment or even a cure, is finally advancing to clinical trial stage. The recent announcement of phase one to two, cl a clinical trial involving transplantation of stem cells into the first human subject is therefore raising hope among patients that an effective stem cell based treatment for Parkinson's may finally be just over the horizon. Put yourself in the position of a Parkinson's disease patient who is already experiencing not being able to move and soft voice and mask like faces and you can't express emotion and you're feeling depressed inside and somebody says and maybe if we do this little thing where we stick stuff into your brain you can wake up and be like a normal person uh, you know think of the emotional appeal of that So it's raising hope among patients that an effective stem cell-based treatment for Parkinson's may finally be just over the horizon. What kind of stem cells? Well, let's find out. However, the, debate, the announcement is also a subject of discussion and debate in the research community. Why? Well, two reasons. One, does it actually work? And two, are there bad side effects? And three, is it ethical? Well, let's find out. 
Stem cells described by the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research, who has absolute moral authority in this because after all, Michael J. Fox suffers from Parkinson's disease. Anything he says must be true. As a renewable source of tissue that can be coaxed to become different cell types of the body, help with maintenance and repair of body tissues by becoming specialized cell types of the tissue or organ where they originate and are seen as having potential to significantly impact the development of disease-modifying treatments for Parkinson's disease. Again, you can feel the pull. Moving on, ISCO announced on March 7 that it is now enrolling patients in the phase one trial of the company's proprietary ISC, HPNSC, which contains a consists of a highly pure population of neural cells derived from the human parthenogenetic cells. That's the adult ones, for what it's worth. Uh, stem cells manufactured under CGMP conditions that have undergone stringent quality control measures and are clear of any micro, microbial and viral contaminants. They report that cl preclinical studies in rodents and non-human primates have shown improve, improvement in Parkinson's disease symptoms and increased in brain dopamine levels following intracranial admission, administration of ISC, uh, HPNSC, which provides neurotropic support and cell replacement to the dying dopaminergic uh, neurons of the recipient Parkinson's brain. ISCO says ISC, HPNSC are safe, well tolerated. Well, that's the company speaking, so be careful. Um, and do not cause adverse effects such as dyskinesia, systemic toxicity, or tumors. Oh, there were tumors with the uh, embryonic cells. Um, in preclinical models, and then it believes ISC, HP, NSC may have broad therapeutic applications for many neurological diseases affecting the brain, the spinal cord, and the eye, including, for what it's worth, macular degeneration. Interesting. The Journal of Parkinson's Disease Research Open Access article arrived at a set of five key questions they believe should be addressed before any stem cell-based trial in Parkinson's disease is done. And four of them have to do with practical issues. I'm going to skip down to number three, which is, can arguments concerning ethics, risk, uh, risk mitigation, <coughs> or trial logistics outweigh concerns regarding the expected efficacy of the cell and constitute a primary justification for choosing one cell type over another in a clinical trial. Maybe we should be doing adults only instead of those embryos that have to come from abortion. Um, and then two or more concerns. Um, skipping on down, acting prematurely has the potential not only well, this is a quote from the guy who wrote the study, who's also uh, vice president of some uh, Parkinson's disease thing and um, has, knows what he's talking about, supposedly. Probably does. Uh, acting prematurely has the potential not only to tarnish many years of scientific work, but can threaten to derail and damage this exciting field of regenerative medicine. Hopefully in 2016, we are ready to take a more careful approach as we strive to repair the Parkinson's disease brain with stem cell-based therapies, avoiding many of the state mistakes that have dogged this field over the last three decades. Why do they dog the field? Researchers want to make a name for themselves. Patients want to cure desperately. And so they'll try anything, and then when it doesn't work and it gets published in the, in the literature, nobody wants to try anything more because we already know it doesn't work. So while the short-term thing may be exciting and wonderful and the long-term damage to Parkinson's disease research in particular and science in general is remarkable. And then uh, medical news today, breakthrough in stem cell research for Proc uh, Parkinson's disease, which basically gives the same uh, project that we just reported on. The authors note that their study shows strong preclinical support for using dopamine cells made from human embryonic stem cells, using approaches similar to those established with fetal cells for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. The, uh, this is one that, that had embryonic cells. There have been suc some successes with using fetal cells 
but these are harder to source and there are ethical concerns about taking tissue from aborted fetuses. Oh, there are ethical concerns. Is it right to do that? Um, here's abcnet.australia. Stem cells successfully injected into Parkinson's disease patient. This is from 13 September 2016. Uh, this is just last year. Researchers have successfully injected stem cells into the brain of a 64-year-old Victorian man. This is uh, Australia as part of a trial treatment uh, for Parkinson's disease that they say is the first of its kind in the world. Oh, they're trying it on a human. And the, research, uh, the researchers at Royal Melbourne Hospital said because the stem cells were treated in a lab, the ethical dilemma of using them was avoided. There is an ethical dilemma and they avoided it by using adult cell, stem cells. Skipping on down, Dr. Nair said the trial would also sidestep the ethical dilemma involved in using stem cells because it was using neural cells manufactured in a lab by a Californian biotech company. Stem cells have always had an ethical problem behind it because you traditionally have been getting it from what is called embryonic stem cells. So you need to get it from embryos that have died. And why did they die? Because somebody got an abortion. Probably uh, not because of Down syndrome, because you don't want those cells. It would be because of a purely elective abortion. So the beauty of this technique is that this is an unfertilized egg activated in a lab, so there are no ethical issues surrounding this to be used as mainstream treatment down the line. Whew. Skipping on down. Oh, we'll, we'll go to another um, article, which is an interesting one, J uh, Yang J.R. Application of embryonic stem cells on Parkinson's disease therapy. This is a summary and also report of somebody doing uh, embryonic stem cells. Uh, applications to Parkinson's disease therapy, genomic and med biomark health sciences. And this one is available on the web. Um, Another surgical approach is to transplant fetal ventral mesencephalic cells in Parkinson's disease patients. However, fetal transplants, fetal, remember this, the ones where you have to actually get the embryos in, uh, fresh, or the fet fetuses fresh. Due to self-renewal capacity and multi-lineage developmental potential, embryonic cells, stem cells, can be ideal cell sources for cell replacement therapy. That's the one where you have it in vitro and we just keep growing it and growing it and growing it. And so you don't have to kill a bunch of embryos. It was done way a long time ago, but somebody else has done that and why not use the stuff that they've already got. However, a majority concern of I embryonic stem uh, cells transplantation is the tumorigenic potential if uh, ES cells are to be applied clinically. So it can cause tumors. And uh, um, they have a couple of references that um, uh, say there's a, this is good, but there's a problem. Here's dopamine re release from nigral transplants visualized in vivo in a Parkinson's patient in nature. I want to warn you, if you use this uh, uh, reference, um, I had to approach it every time from doing Google Scholar and then clicking this rather than actually just put, plugging this in. If you do, it says your time has expired or something like that. Um, synaptic dopamine release from embryonic nigral transplants has been, uh, th that's putting it in the substantia nigra instead of in the putamen, has been monitored in the striatum of a patient with Parkinson's disease using um, uh, 11 carbon, I, that should be, uh, 11 should be superscript. Uh, Reichelplied positon emission tomography, that's to figure out whether this stuff actually belongs there or not. Um, to measure dopamine D2 receptor occupancy by the endogenous transmitter. In this patient who had received a transplant in the right putamen 10 years earlier, grafts had restored both basal and drug-induced dopamine 
release to normal levels. This was associated with sustained marked clinical benefit and normalized levels of dopamine storage in the grafted putamen. The one that wasn't grafted didn't work, uh, it was continuing to deteriorate. Uh, despite an ongoing disease process, grafted neurons can thus continue for a decade to store and release dopamine and give rise to substantial symptomatic relief. That sounds wonderful. We should be doing more of this, no? Um, interesting, I, uh, I'm just going to read one thing from a figure of that, because most of it's already contained in the, uh, in the uh, abstract we just read. But in figure, percentage of the day spent in off phase and motor exam and examination score of the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale, scale maximum score 108, in the practically defined off phase preoperatively and at various time points after implantation of ventral mesencephalic tissue from four human embryos into the anterior, middle, and posterior portions of the right putamen of a patient with PD. They are giving, it isn't just a matter of one fetus can supply 20 people. It's you have four fetuses per person. That raises an interesting question, supposing that um, we find out that it needs to be matched. So uh, should uh, you have four abortions per side or eight abortions total in order to get these results. Now I think you understand a little more the uh, ethical concerns. Freed CR et al. Transplantation of embryonic dopamine neurons for severe Parkinson's disease. This is one of the most fascinating papers. It's 2001 and it's given you actually <coughs> fetal tissue. Um, this one is available on the internet. Um, I'm going to read the entire background, uh, our entire abstract, which in the New England Journal is separated into five different uh, pieces. Transplantation of human embryonic dopamine, neur and dopamine neurons into the brains of patients with Parkinson's disease has proved beneficial in open clinical trials. However, whether this intervention would be more effective than sham surgery in a controlled trial is not known. In other words, maybe just because you're paying so much attention to them, they feel like they should get better, they're getting better, but it isn't really the treatment that's doing it. So what do you do? You do half of them one way and half of them another way that doesn't actually involve putting the cells in. We randomly assigned 40 patients who were 34 to 75 years of age and had severe Parkinson's disease, mean duration 14 years, to receive a transplant of nerve cells or undergo sham surgery. Some people are going to get surgery, but they're not actually going to get the cells. All were to be followed in a double-blind placebo, uh, double-blind manner for one year. In the transplant recipients, cultured mesencephalic tissue from four embryos was implanted into the putamen bilaterally. So I guess in this case, you have four fetuses that die for each side or for both sides, I'm not sure. This is what happens when you do that the right way. In the patients who underwent sham surgery, holes were drilled in the skull, but the dura was not penetrated. The primary outcome was a subjective global rating of the change in the severity of the disease, scored in sale from minus three to plus three at uh, one year, with negative scores indicating a worsening of symptoms and positive scores and improvement. And we're going to find out whether this stuff actually works by doing a double-blind, placebo-controlled study. Okay, the mean scores on the global rating scale for the improvement of or deterioration at one year were 0.0, .0 plus or minus 2.1 in the transplant group and minus 0 0.4 plus or minus 1.7. You can't tell the difference. Among younger patients, 60 years old or younger, standardized tests of Parkinson's disease revealed significant improvement in the transplantation group as compared with sham surgery uh, group when patients were tested in the morning before receiving medication. And there's some statistics there for you. Boy, with that, it seems like you should recommend the treatment, right? 
Um, now, caution there, because if you keep testing a bunch of st different statistics, eventually one will come out correct by chance. And that's why when they start the trial, they have to say what they're going to test and what their score is going to be. And then if they want to play with the numbers inside, they can. But nobody wants to take and say, well, actually, it works for younger patients, but it doesn't work for older ones, and say you've actually proved that. And you're going to find out why I'm going to argue that they did not prove that. Okay? There was no significant improvement in older patients in the transplantation group. Fiber outgrowth from the transplanted neurons was detected in 17 of the 20 patients in the transplantation group. So they actually grew fibers, as indicated by an increase in 18 uh, fluorine fluorodopa. That's you stick in dopa that's been tagged with fluorine and see if it gets absorbed in the area. And so you can, you can say that for sure. On positron emission tomography or post-mortem examination. So they, they did it either way. Uh, two people died in the treatment group. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, after improvement in the first year, dystonia and dyskinesia occurred in 15% of the patients who received transplants, even after reduction or continuation of the doses of levodopa. So yeah, they didn't have Parkinson's anymore, but now they have movements that uh, they didn't really need. Conclusions. Human embryonic dopamine neuron transplants survive in patients with severe Parkinson's disease and result in some clinical benefit in younger but not older patients. Well, that sounds good. Well, half good. I think they're straining. And you're going to find out why. Oh, besides the obvious uh, grant money and publication stuff. Let's uh, skip down uh, just a little bit to let you know how they did this. Only in the operating room did the neurosurgeon learn. So the neurosurgeon had no clue as to what group they were assigned to until they actually got the patient down in and they're ready to go. Uh, whether sham operation or transplantation would be performed. In fact, they probably delayed it until in the middle of the surgery, but anyway. Surgery was performed with the patient awake with local anesthesia administered to the skin of the forehead. Four twist drill holes through the frontal bone were made along the planned axis of the tracks. The patient in the sham surgery group underwent an identical procedure except that the dura mater was not penetrated after the twist, uh, twist drill holes had been made in the frontal bone. They drill the holes and they either stick the needle in or they don't. So the surgeons know who's what. But the patients don't have a clue. And the doctors who are following them don't have a clue. And that way, they can't, you know, you can't say, oh, it's going to work, it's going to work. No, it's not going to work because I got the sham. And, and fake people out, OK? So skipping on down, transplantation in patients with pre previous SAM surgery. Ooh, what was this about? Patients randomly assigned to sham surgery had the option of receiving an implant of dopamine neurons after they completed the double line phase of the study. Okay, for a year, you're going to get no, uh, no treatment. But after that, if you really want it, we'll go ahead and, and do it for you. Which lasted for one year after the original surgery. 14 of the 20 patients in the sham surgery group received transplants and subsequent operations. So, yes. Now that it's all done, I'd like to have my, uh, my uh, embryonic cell infusion, uh, embryonic stem cell. Um, adverse events, serious adverse events that necessitated hospitalization or caused death during the one year follow up period are listed in table two. One serious adverse event, a subdural hematoma first detected about six weeks after surgery was judged to be possibly related to the surgery. Well, yeah, I would think so. Um, since the magnetic resonance image had been normal on the day after surgery, so it probably came, but maybe it was a slow bleed, maybe it wasn't, I'm not sure. The subdural hematoma resolved without intervention, so it wasn't a big deal. Um, 
but they did wind up in the hospital for a little bit, so it cost something. Okay, more serious events occurred in the transplantation group than in the SAM surgery group, eight and one respectively. Uh, a total of 13 non-serious events. Now, before we go there, um, I'm just going to tell you that the eight and one, uh, one of them was a heart attack. Is that the fault of the surgery? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, there was an automobile accident. Was that the fault of the surgery? Probably not. In fact, all of them were uh, judged as being probably not, except for that subdural hematoma. Uh, of interest, the sham surgery had a hysterectomy, and that was counted as an adverse event, which kind of hard to make that into a, uh, a, uh, a related incident. Um, a total of 13 non-serious events of various degrees of severity were reported in 40 patients, the 275 events of types that were reported more than once are listed in Table 3, so you can look them up. There were no significant differences in the severity of adverse events between the transplantation and SAMS, sham surgery patients. So, hey, doesn't really hurt you. That sounds pretty good, right? Might help, doesn't hurt, why not? You can see why those 14 after their year of they can't have the surgery said, yes, we want the surgery. Subsequent follow-up since the completion of the double-blind protocol, follow-up of the patients has continued. Evaluation at up to three years in the 19 patients in the original transplantation group showed a 28% improvement over baseline in total UPDRS scores while off medication. 38% improvement among the younger patients and 14% among the older patients uh, probability for the whole group is, is good. The probability for the younger group is great. Probability for the older people, nah. As determined with the general uh, estimating equation method for the total group and the younger patients in the group, respectively. So why not do it on the younger patients at least? Of the 33 patients who ultimately received transplants and who have now survived as for as long as three years after the surgery, dystonia and dyskinesia developed. They're starting to make movements they didn't want. 15% and persisted after a substantial reduction in or elimination of therapy with dopamine agonist drugs. So they traded in their Parkinson's for another movement disorder, only this time too many movements instead of too few. The five patients were all 60 years old or younger at the time of surgery. Ooh, hitting the group you'd like to treat and all had severe fluctuations in symptoms of Parkinson's disease before the surgery. Three received transplants during the initial double-blind uh, phase, and the other two were originally in sham surgery and decided to get their surgery after all. Okay? So, symptoms in all five patients had improved during the first years after transplantation. They'd been getting better and better, and all of a sudden, start doing things they didn't want. Because of the lack of efficacy of the transplants in older patients and the late appearance of dyskinesia in some younger patients, the six remaining patients, the people who hadn't yet opted for getting this wonderful stuff, four of whom were older than 60 years old and two of whom were 60 years old or younger, were advised against undergoing transplantation by means of the current method. That, my friends, is the real opinion of the doctors, it's failure. You may have read this as a success. They didn't think it was worth recommending on the patients that already had the holes drilled and they were ready to go. Now, my take on all this, there are ethical issues regarding the use of fetal or embryonic tissue to treat human disease unless one is a materialist. Well, of course, materialism has problems with the establishment of any ethics. Uh, now, that doesn't mean materialists have no ethics. As a matter of fact, they often have better ethics than materialism can support rationally. Let me give you an illustration. Peter Singer advocated for the euthanasia of people with decreased consciousness. Then, his mother got dementia and that was different. Now, I'm not going to say, Peter Singer, you ought to follow your own beliefs. I think his beliefs were wrong. 
I think that when it became personal, suddenly it hit home to him that really that materialism derived ethic was wrong. But anyway, uh, the evidence can change and who knows, maybe we'll find out that embryonic stem cells done in a certain way will be wonderful and that adult stem cells won't do the same job. But that's not the way it looks right now. It looks like embryonic and fetal stem cell transplants are a dud when treating Parkinson's disease and that induced adult stem cells look more promising at this point and are theoretically better as rejection should not be a problem especially if you can use your own cells. And teratomas should be more rare, we think. Maybe they'll have teratomas too, who knows? This is one of the things that you don't know when you're starting out. But the question can be asked, did we waste time pursuing fetal stem cell scares? Maybe, if so, why? Would strict, strict ethics have saved us this time? Now, before we go too far down that ro road, I wanna make a point. Is it proper to argue in this way? Um, you may remember honesty is the best policy. I think attributed among other things to Abraham Lincoln. But some wag has pointed out that he who is honest because it is the best policy is corrupt already. Because when it no longer is the best policy, he's not gonna be honest. <laughs> right? Okay, if, now I'm gonna ask you some questions here if one does not believe in slaughtering animals for food, which there are a few of us here who kind of think that's not a good idea, is it permissible to use their leather? You may remember that PETA not only vigorously argues against eating hamburgers, but also against wearing leather belts or shoes. Well, <clears throat> what about their insulin? Now it's getting a little tougher. You've got type 1 diabetes, the only cure is insulin. It comes from slaughtered pigs. Not even slaughtered cows because their insulin is less like humans. Is that legitimate? Well, okay, so you're saying, well, maybe, uh, you know, as long as I didn't actually slaughter the pigs and I'm not really encouraging it, well, you're supporting them financially a little bit, well, how much support is starts to get problematic. But I think there is an ethical issue because what about the skin of Jews? Would you make lampshades out of a perfectly good skin from Jews that were in concentration camps? Ah, that's getting a little dicey, huh? Maybe not. Now, now think about these ethical questions that are involved. You know, greater love has no man than this, that a man give down his life for his friends. Well, what about if his friends come to him and say, uh, we need you to give down your, uh, give your life for me. It's an interesting movie I saw a piece of. I, I didn't see the whole thing. And I'm not even sure. It may have been a, a trailer or an ad or something, but... Uh, there's a movie about a rich but unethical, I think it was an underworld character, who had heart disease, and he assembled a team of cardiologists to provide him with a heart transplant. Sounds wonderful. One of the doctors turned out to have a perfect uh, 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 histologic match, and he realized what was going to happen if he didn't do anything about it and tried to escape. And of course that raises the entire question of, you know, what about taking stuff from people un involuntarily? What about taking stuff from fetuses involuntarily? What about raising fetuses so that you can harvest the stem cells? It's interesting. Should we be refusing to transplant embryonic cells or perhaps fetal cells because they came from aborted embryos? 
uh, one of the ethical things that they try to do when they're doing fetal cells is they insist that the uh, aborted fetuses cannot, uh, they can't know anything about what the cel cells are going to go for. Is that what you want with your uh, aborted fetus? Uh, some interesting, difficult questions. There are definitely ethical issues. The vociferous denial that there are any ethical issues and the insistence that science should be completely free on these issues. Seems like it could be intended, maybe not by the person who's advocating it, but maybe by someone who wants to degrade our cultural system. To justify abortion because, see, now some good will come of it and it can be ethically normalized. And if you start out believing abortion is fine, but those people over there just can't handle it, then this is a wonderful issue. It's called a wedge issue, you see. But it's providing new movement for people with Parkinson's disease. And they're living longer and they're living healthier. Why can't you just ignore those fake ethical questions you keep raising? Is that an ethical issue? In some African societies, there's a cultural belief that having intercourse with a virgin can cure AIDS. Don't ask me how they got that. I have no clue. It sounds magical to me. As you can imagine, this leads to all kinds of clearly wrong behavior, including young girls whose first experience with sex is rape after which they get HIV themselves. <clears throat> anyway, are fetal and embryonic cell tr treatments merely the Western version of this kind of magical thinking? Maybe. But that's my opinion now, it's your turn. I have a comment back here. Clyde. Yeah, I was just wondering about um, the ethics. If I, were to go, if I had Parkinson's and they said they're going to drill, drill two holes in my head, maybe I'd come out with uh, the treatment done and maybe not. That, uh, how do they get past the IRB? What, what was the incentive? What were, what were they, uh, how did they provide some incentive for them to do that? Well, one of the things that you will find out is that in many places, the IRB has ethics people. And in many places, the ethics people have a materialistic underpinning. And so they kind of know what's generally accepted, but in terms of, you know, what you do with... Uh, I mean, think of it, if, if we can drill holes in it. We have implants now that can be used as electrical stimulators for the putamen. And you drill holes there, you put in electrodes, you turn on the stimulator, and suddenly the patient can move. You can watch it in surgery. You can make sure you've got it in the right place. These people are being worked on while they're still conscious. Uh, Parkinson's disease is devastating enough that if you have a clearly demonstrated benefit, the IRB will generally approve it. And what happens is that the questions, there are clearly ethical issues about using human embryos for somebody else's benefit without their consent. Oh, but the mom consents. Um, time after time after time you hear these ethical concerns and they're not dismissed. And now that we have human uh, uh, adult uh, pluripotent cells, they really like that. It tells you that this, this idea that uh, abortion doesn't really count 
Um, they know better. But that's, uh, but you see, you have, you have a lot of people that are like Peter Singer. Peter Singer is held up as a, he, as a great ethicist. And, you know, he will tell you that a, uh, a uh, chimpanzee has more value than a deformed human who will not get any further, or perhaps maybe even than a healthy human um, but who isn't wanted in the family and is doomed to a life of, I don't know, crime, whatever. The, the logic of the thinking says that consciousness trumps other things and the, and the chimpanzee is clearly more conscious and therefore is worth more. And when you lose consciousness, you're not worth much. And so as you're going slipping into dementia, as you get further and further down, you're going backwards into the animal ra <coughs> realm. And, you know, you should just go off on an ice flow like the Eskimos for the good of the society. Because societal good trumps your good at that point. And like I say, it worked fine until his mother developed dementia and all of a sudden... Oh, saw it in a slightly different light. It's all logical if you accept materialism. And one of the things that I see being done is the just drive to make materialism the religion of uh, our country in general. It's, otherwise, it's hard to explain why the vociferousness of the of the mandates that are being put out. I mean, you know, if you're really being materialist, then, you know, people who believe uh, one of those old books back then, you know, maybe the Quran, maybe the Bible, why are we fighting this? You know, they're going to live out their life Yes. In my younger years, I was hitching a ride through the Andes in the back of a cargo truck, and we picked up another young man who was a Jew. We got into a discussion on what we should do with primitive peoples. He was adamant that we should leave them alone, not do anything to influence them. Well. I was reading a book this week that talked about Nazism and the things they did. But thinking about Australia taking away the children of Aborigines, putting them in school to um, civilize them, we did it in this country as well. And Well, we're an enlightened group in this country, but uh, still we, we did that. These are ethical questions. And then the other ethical question you can ask is, these people are going to have contact with civilization sooner or later. What kind of civilization do you want them to have contact with? The trader who has nothing more than financial interest in there? Oil. <laughs> uh, comment down here. Here. As, uh, <clears throat> as I recall, in 2014, I think it was, a Japanese researcher and a Harvard researcher collaborated and took uh, adult human skin cells and by placing them in a lowered temperature environment that was just above the threshold for being lethal, uh, they became induced pluripotent cells. Uh, I haven't seen any follow-up on that, but that would get around the ethical objections. Uh, do you know of any follow-up yeah. research that was done on that? I don't know. I'm going to be very careful Yamanaka about that. Yamanaka was the name, I think, of the Japanese yeah. researcher. The, the researchers that I've seen, uh, there are... Uh, the, 
the people who are writing today commonly take these take the nucle uh, nuclei out or the DNA out and put it into a human egg that's been stripped of its well, DNA. They, they and reduced then, the temperature for only a half an hour. And yeah. Set it, you know. yeah, there is, nobody's using that simple way of doing it that I know of. And part of the reason is because, um, no, I don't know what the part of the reason is. I should say part of the reason maybe, because there was somebody who was doing, uh, creating human, uh, adult stem cells mm -hmm. uh, and turned out to be doing it fraudulently. So I am not sure whether that you know, simple cooling method actually worked well or not. And uh, I, if it works, it would be wonderful. Um, but I'm cautious about saying, oh yeah, that's the way we should do it because I don't know for sure. Uh, the people who are doing the research don't seem to be using it, and that would be the obvious thing to use if it actually worked. Uh, I mean, one of the things that's interesting is that they have really quit pushing embryonic stem cells. In spite of that wonderful article that says it works in younger patients, well, you know, when they can't, uh, can't recommend it to their own patients, that kind of tells you something. I was wondering about, you know, you were talking about drawing a line between what's valuable and what's not valuable. Um, where would we get any kind of um, guidance where that line should be? I mean, I, I saw on YouTube some guy taking two plants, and um, one plant he just cussed and sweared at, and the other plant, he loved it, you know, and gave it all kinds of, you know, uh, accolades and whatever. And sure enough, the two plants, one was really sickly and the other one wasn't. So... Do, do plants um, understand what we're doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know exactly what was happening there, but, but he, it claimed to be true, you know, and I've heard that from other places that you can actually sing to a plant and the plants are better, They're, they grow a lot healthier and whatever, and the plants that you treat like dirt, they're just sickly or whatever. So, so here we are trying to do good, you know, to make everything better. And um, well, with plants, you know, we have, to, we have to kill them and eat them and so, <laughs> where do you draw the line? I mean, that's, that's my question. Where do you draw the line here? I, I can say this. I think that, uh, that a materialistic underpinning really makes it hard to, to draw a line anywhere. Um, and I think that the lines that are drawn are sometimes confused and, and not rational. Um, uh, it, it's really, uh, there are ethical questions. And I don't know that any of us has all of the answers. But I think that recognizing that they're there is better than saying, no, they, they can't be there because it's all material anyway and it doesn't matter. I, I think, and, and that raises an interesting question. Maybe God allows plants to respond better when they're loved than, than when they're, than when they're uh, uh, abused, even though they don't feel it in the standard way. I don't know. Once you get outside of materialism, then it actually could make sense. Yes, come in here it, and then Clyde. It, it seems that as long as abortion is legalized, scientists will want to take advantage of, it reminds me of our recent road trip, and you see roadkill, the next thing you know, the vultures have come down to have breakfast or lunch, 
you know, it's, it's in the natural world, that's, that's what they do. It's easier. But they're going to take advantage of what's there. They yeah. can't defend itself. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of a vicious illustration, but yeah. as, as long as, and, and is abortion legal in all states of the United States? Um, yes, because of the Supreme Court. Yes. So Interestingly, the Europeans have stronger restrictions on abortion than we do. Is that right? That is right. I didn't know that. And uh, uh, the abortion doctor that recently got uh, nailed for, um, uh, for uh, he didn't get nailed for, produ uh, for, for aborting uh, fetuses. He got nailed for, um, for killing babies after they'd come out of the womb. What do you do with a botched abortion? Well, you make sure that it never sees the light of day. <coughs> anyway. Yeah, I was just wondering, you probably mentioned it and I missed it, but um, for counting success, you know, it's like the budget, they said, they said we had a 10% reduction. Well, it was a reduction of what we were going to raise. Yes. It's, so, it's so actually, it's some, in some cases, it's a 1% increase, but it's not, the 11% <coughs> increase they were expecting. So uh, assuming Parkinson's is progressive, did they count those that didn't get worse as being a success? I was wondering how they did that. Uh, you would have to read the specific article. As you can see, the New England Old Journal put the best face on it, but they didn't really believe in their own product. Good morning. Reading from uh, Philippians 4, now we could all stand on the head of a pin, how many angels are there, but speaking of moderation um, in all things, um, <coughs> verse, verses, uh, I entreat you these <coughs> also true young fellows, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, and Clement also, and <coughs> with the other, um, my fellow laborers, whose manners <coughs> uh, are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, reading from the King James here, it's very poetic, but in everything by prayer and supplication with, thinking, with <coughs> thanksgiving, let your rejoicing, your requests be made <coughs> known unto God. <coughs> so here, we read, when you mentioned righteousness, righteousness means balance, whatever's balance, is equity, it can mean equity and does mean equity, and the peace of God says, be careful of nothing but in everything by prayer. So we drop down to verse eight. Finally, brethren, Whatsoever things are true, I'm sure we know this from our mother's milk, whatsoever things that are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, power, energia, in the Greek, the word there, go to righteous and run that all the way down mm -hmm. to, you get energy, and if there be any praise, then think on these things. So uh, I think that would apply to an, uh, what we're speaking of here. We're familiar with all of us, what's going on with stem cells. But what would you say about this King James 
version here? Well, I would say that uh, the only reason for bringing this up would be that uh, I think we need to be aware of these issues if we have to deal with science all the time. And to realize that there are ethical issues and to realize that the denial of those ethical issues is a, if I can put it this way, it's a satanic plot. Whether it's, uh, the people who are advocating it are uh, wholly given over to uh, uh, satanic influences, whether they're useful idiots, I don't know. But I think that the idea that, that there are no ethical issues, it, except the ones that I want, for interestingly enough, we have to be very, very careful about uh, uh, climate change, global warming, but not about this stuff, because this stuff is that old Christian stuff that doesn't really count anymore. Uh, there's a problem. I think I'm going to leave it there. And uh, next week you can come back and uh, watch some, um, a, um, if I can put it that way, a quasi-scientific approach to uh, history in the Bible. And... Uh, I I a question uh, next week. Uh, Dr. Roger Swelt will be uh, giving that to us.